start my presentation. One second. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yep. Great. All right, so hi everybody. Thanks so much for having me on today. Um, I am going to do a brief presentation on some spring mushrooms that you can forage for in Wisconsin. So first, just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Miranda Ehrlich. I use she, her pronouns, and I work for the Sierra Club, and I'm currently based in Washington, D.C. Um, before my current role in D.C., I used to work for the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign in Madison, so uh, that's uh, how I'm connected to Wisconsin foraging. Um, before I uh, kind of get into the information, I want to just caveat this whole thing with I am not an expert forager. I am just an enthusiastic amateur. Um, I've been foraging mushrooms for about four years. And so I know some things, but I don't know everything. And I highly recommend that you reference additional sources before venturing out to hunt mushrooms based on the information in this uh, slide deck. Uh, so we'll start with some mushroom foraging basics. Um, so first of all, what is a mushroom? Uh, a mushroom is essentially the fruiting body of fungi. So um, underneath the ground, um, fungi have what's called mycelium, and this is actually the, um, the biggest part of this organism. Um, and the mushrooms are the fruiting bodies, and so they contain spores, and they're how um, fungi reproduce. And so when a mushroom goes up, the spores go out, and they um, uh, reproduce the organism. And so this is the part that most people are familiar with uh, and that people eat. Um, where can you find mushrooms? Mushrooms are growing all over the place. Um, commonly, uh, I like to forage for mushrooms in the woods. Um, that's usually the best place to find them, but I've found some growing um, in uh, on my block in the city. I've found them growing in fields. I've even, uh, Cassie actually, uh, who also is on this call, once sent me a picture of a mushroom growing in her basement. And so mushrooms can really grow anywhere that there is, um, some kind of nutrient and uh, water for them. Uh, one question a lot of folks ask is, where is it actually legal for me to hunt for edible mushrooms? And um, that's a really good question. Uh, it's, you know, obviously when you're foraging, you shouldn't be trespassing on other people's property and you should always make sure to look up local regulations um, before you go say, look for mushrooms at a state park. The good news is that in the state of Wisconsin, we actually have really great um, regulations around this that are um, both are both are helpful to foragers, but also make sure this is being done in a sustainable way. So, if you are on state park land or state forest land, um, in basically all almost all circumstances, it's legal to forage for uh, wild edible mushrooms for personal consumption. So that's not foraging to sell them, you know, at the farmer's market, but it's to have personal consumption. And so um, that's helpful. But I definitely would say look up um, local regulations before you go to a park. Um, and then the last note here is make sure if you're when you're foraging for mushrooms, you're doing it in a sustainable way. Um, since mushrooms are sort of analogous to fruit on a plant, um, it's definitely not the most destructive part that you could be eating, right? It's not like eating the roots of a plant, it's like eating the fruit, but still you don't want to take all of the mushrooms in a specific area um, because that is their reproduction mechanism. And so if you take all the mushrooms, then the spores don't get released to be reproduced. Although there are some studies that show that actually mushrooms often will release their spores pretty early. So sometimes foraging doesn't even have an impact even if you were to take them all, but still recommend making sure you're not just clearing out all the mushrooms in area. And then last but not least, uh, remember when you're trying to identify a mushroom, check, check and check again, you know, call up a friend, especially if you're new to this, who actually knows their mushrooms, consult reference guides, um, YouTube videos, etc. I personally always Google poisonous lookalike whenever I find something I think is edible, just to make sure I've got all my bases covered. And I know any uh, lookalikes I should be watching out for. Oh, and also this picture is a piece of foraged art 
um, that I made with some mushrooms, which is another fun use for mushrooms if you're not trying to eat them. Uh, so real quick, just wanted to talk through a couple of uh, key identifying features and parts of a mushroom. Um, this is a, a mushroom that looks like uh, an, an Amanita species of mushroom, which actually is the most toxic kind of mushroom. Um, and mushrooms can look like very, very different from this. Um, so you'll see at the top, there's the cap, um, there's gills underneath it. Um, a lot of mushrooms don't actually have gills, they have pores instead. So they might have holes underneath the cap or they might not really have a discernible cap at all um, as they might be growing on a tree and might be more of a shelf mush mushroom. Um, sometimes you can see scales on the top of a mushroom. Um, there's a can sometimes be a ring around the stalk. The presence or absence of a ring can be a key identifying feature. Um, and with some of these really poisonous species, a lot of them do have a ring around the stalk, although that's there's no foolproof one way to tell a mushroom is poisonous or not poisonous. So you have to really go by individual species and, and walk through all the identifying features. Um, there's the stem of the mushroom and then the cup. Sometimes mushrooms will grow out of a little cup and you'll be able to see that at the bottom. That's also often a key feature. And then there also can be mycelial threads at the very bottom where it's connected to the broader mycelium. Um, remember, don't force a fit. If you have a mushroom that, you know, eight out of 10 identifying features match the thing you're trying to match it to, um, that's not good enough. It needs to be 100% and you need to be certain and you probably need to have seen this mushroom several times before you ever try to eat it or do anything else with it um, to be really, really sure that you got the right one. Um, so don't force a fit. There's a lot of mushrooms that look very similar to other mushrooms and that's a recipe for, for bad news. Um, make sure you're checking with multiple sources as I mentioned on the last slide. And then also make sure to cook your mushrooms. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but even most edible wild mushrooms are um, toxic raw. And so for morels, for example, you need to cook them in order for them to be edible. So it's a really good um, thing to just make sure you always cook your mushrooms no matter, um, no matter what. All right, so now we're gonna, into, gonna get into three uh, species that are relatively easy to identify. So beginner level species that you can find in the spring in Wisconsin. Um, the first one is morels um, or morchella species. Um, and these are ones a lot of people have heard of. They're very distinctive looking. So as you can see from the photos, they have a really distinctive looking cap that has ridges and deep pits. Uh, it looks kind of brainy. It's hollow inside. So that's a really critical identifying feature with morels is that when you cut them in half, they are hollow. And also the cap is attached at the bottom. So it's not hanging off the sides. So as you can see in, in this here, the cap kind of goes out. Here, the cap is attached at the bottom. It's all one connected thing. Um, and so that those are some really key identifying features. Morels also generally grow on the forest floor um, and they're, uh, so they grow from next to dead elm trees, um, but yeah, you will usually find them growing on the forest floor rather than growing on wood. Um, you, where you can find them. So it varies by location, but generally it's um, during May, um, sometimes early June, depending on how late the winter stays in Wisconsin. Um, as I mentioned, uh, dying elm trees Dead and dying elm trees is really a great place to find morels. If you can learn to identify a dead elm tree, you're going to be much better at finding morels. Um, apple trees are also a good place to find them. Um, although one quick note about that is uh, old apple orchards have long been considered a good place to find morels, but um, some of these orchards have had lead arsenate sprayed on them. And so I tend to stay away from that because you just don't know what kinds of pesticides were sprayed on old apple orchards, um, especially, you know, back in the 1920s or 30s or kind of prior to a lot of regulation on this. And so, um, you know, uh, I would be a little more cautious there. Um, oh, and then the last thing is to near, uh, rails are often found near running water. So if you can find a stream, um, and there's dead elm trees, you're in a really good morel spot. Um, how to cook morels. So again, morels must be cooked. They are toxic raw. I really like to fry them in butter. 
Um, I personally prefer to wash mine to get the grit out of them. Although uh, some people disagree on this and think you shouldn't wash them. My dad is a uh, very much believer in do not wash them or else we have a slight disagreement on that. I personally think mushrooms are built to absorb water. Um, it's not going to hurt them, but you just need to do more to like uh, get some of the excess water out if you're gonna that approach. Um, quick note on toxic looks lookalikes to morel. So there are a couple um, lookalikes to be aware of. One is the verpa species. Um, now this actually is interesting because there's a little bit of controversy actually about both of these about how edible they are. There are some people who think verpas are edible, um, but I would still, I'm not going to advocate for eating either, eating either of these. Um, just I'm an amateur. I'm not an expert. I think we all should probably stick to for those of us just starting out sticking to morels and not these other more advanced level mushrooms, I think would be the right approach. You can tell a verpa um, because it has, you can see that the cap has, is not attached at the bottom and it is also not hollow inside. Um, and then for the gyrometra species, um, so these actually are definitely toxic. They contain gyrometrin, which is a a uh, toxic element that's sim also been found in like rocket fuel. You definitely don't want to eat it. There are people who will boil these in multiple changes of water and prepare them in a very specific way to eat them. Um, this is the top subject of some very fierce Facebook fights that I've seen in mushroom groups. Um, I personally would never eat one of these and I do not recommend eating them. I think it's there's a lot of other great mushrooms out there. Um, so I would not recommend it. Second mushroom that you can forage for in the spring is golden oyster mushrooms. So these are really interesting because they're actually an invasive species in Wisconsin. And I mostly have found them in urban areas. Um, so found them actually in downtown Madison. Uh, massive, uh, a, a, tr a massive tree had just been totally colonized by these mushrooms. Um, and I, my pet theory is that they escaped the farmer's market, but I don't really know that for sure. <laughs> um, and to identify these mushrooms, so the top of the golden oyster mushroom is golden yellow and can kind of become tan with age. The underside has white gills that grow up, up the stalk and they grow in big clusters on wood. So trees, stumps, et cetera. You can see a really big picture of the golden ones um, on my counter that I found from that tree. I've also included a picture of a different kind of oyster mushroom just so you can see the underside and how those um, those gills that are very closely spaced together run up the whole length of the stalk. So they're kind of distinctive looking and look a little bit like oyster shape. Um, and again, where you can find it, this one's a little bit unpredictable. Again, I've, I've actually never found it in the woods, although theoretically you could find it there. Um, but this is uh, kind of sporadic. Um, but when you do come across it, it's, it can be really big clusters. And so and because it's an invasive species, we actually want to pick all these mushrooms. So um, I thought it would be important to highlight. And I'll also mention too, there's other kinds of oyster mushrooms that grow um, native in Wisconsin that are uh, that also come in the spring. So if you're interested in learning more about oyster mushrooms, I definitely would encourage you to look those up. That can, that's a fairly beginner level um, uh, mushroom that you can uh, forage for. And uh, I just want to emphasize one more time that these grow on wood. So they would grow on trees, uh, they might grow on dead logs, but you would not find them growing out of the ground. And then how to cook it. Again, butter and frying it is a, is a great way to cook basically any mushroom. I also really like these in soup um, and they add a nice texture as well as flavor. And, and then for the last mushroom I'm going to highlight today is the pheasant back mushroom or Cereoporus squamosus. Now this mushroom is a little bit um, less popular with foragers because it's kind of weird. Um, and so it, uh, it actually is, um, it smells kind of like watermelon rind or cucumber rind. And um, some people think it's not the best flavor, but I think it is worth foraging and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, this mushroom is a polypore. So it's actually one of the, it's a very prolific mushroom. You'll find it everywhere and it's really pretty easy to identify for a beginner. Um, it's a polypore mushroom. So it has holes on the bottom, uh, no gills. 
um, and it's a white pore surface. So you can see um, in the picture kind of what it looks like on the underside. On the top, it has a brown feathery pattern. It grows on wood. And as I mentioned, it smells like watermelon rind. And you can find this mid-April through late May. Um, that's the best time to harvest them. Um, you actually can really find them all season long. So through that time all the way through the fall. But a lot of times when you find it at that stage, it's gonna be super old, super big and leathery and gross. And at that stage, you don't wanna eat these. These are only good to eat when they're young and still tender. Um, but they're, they're, it's not that they become poisonous, it's just that bec they become like kind of leathery and gross and not worth eating. And a lot of times the bugs will infest them too. So um, yeah, but as a spring mushroom, these are great. And um, I've even found these, again, in city areas growing on stumps. Um, they're really common in Wisconsin. And so um, this is one I feel like um, if you go out looking for mushrooms, it's sort of the, um, the consolation prize from morels. If you don't find any morels, you can find these. Um, and to cook it to make it taste good, I think, um, so usually peel off the pore surface and then slice it. I like to fry it in butter and then sprinkle it with salt, pepper, and also lemon juice. And that's the key ingredient to make these taste good, in my opinion, is, is the lemon juice. Because um, otherwise, they're just little, they're a little bit weird. Um, but if you do that, uh, I think they're great in pasta. And there's a photo there of some ramps that I also foraged, um, and then a pasta with a pesto I made out of it with these pheasant back mushrooms. All right, so that's all I have uh, for my presentation. Thank you so much for joining. We're now gonna move to a discussion section. So after uh, uh, we've, we're gonna stop the recording and then move into a more informal